Hey kids, this is Jack. Welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, welcome aboard. Uh, right now what we're doing is Planet Zoo. I'm playing in the sandbox mode and this is my Adventure Jungle Zoo. Uh, the Adventure Jungle Zoo is nothing but tropical animals, jungle animals specifically. For those of you who watched the last episode, you may be wondering what it is that you're looking at. Well, there's a story. You see, it seems that after the last episode, when I was finishing work on the Capuchin Monkey Habitat, I forgot to save the game. Oh sure, it recorded just fine, and you got to see the habitat in the, uh, you know, in the actual episode, but it didn't save. So when I pulled up this uh, zoo to continue it wasn't there at all. So what I had to do was basically rebuild it from scratch. Now, if you remember, I went uh, uh, mm, early on I was looking for a blueprint of net roofs. Well, I found it as you can see cuz this is the new capuchin monkey habitat. Um, let me just show it off a little. It's got this blueprint. Uh, I'll be honest, uh, off the top of my head, I don't remember who made it. I will find out who made this and I will uh, give them proper credit in the comments or in the information below. Um, I used glass for the barriers up front. As you can see, these are all glass panels. And then back here, it's all log. I've got some moss covered rock in the back, more log. And then of course you got your climbing facilities and more climbing and uh, a foraging pit in fact let me uh, let me do this since I've got it here um, but yeah and it was I'll be honest it was a little uh, frustrating to have an entire hour's worth of work you know I put in an hour a little bit over an hour on that original uh, habitat only to have it you know vanish but as you can see I was able to to put it back together um, making it a lot closer to my original plan in fact um, just adding some bedding to there we go so you know, and they do have toys, and they've got plants, and they've got rocks, and their little roller feeders, and, uh, you know, the monkeys. Well, I hadn't put any bedding in, so it's sleeping on the ground, but that's all right. Um, technically, because I've got a roof over it, even if it's a rope roof, it's considered an interior uh, exhibit. So, you know, and I, I decorated around it, and I... Uh, you know, I've got the signs up for the animals, and the guests seem to appreciate it. So, <clears throat> anyway, uh, I wanted to let you know what happened. You know, it just didn't save. It was my my fault, my mistake. Uh, human error, as they put it. But we're going to continue from here. Um, and... Uh, You know, I knew what I was about to say. I really did. I hate when that happens, when I just completely and totally lose what I was going to say. Um, oh, yeah. What I want to do from here, um, I'm, I, I want to do a little path decoration. I want to add some shops. I want to uh, spruce up certain locations. And then after that, um, we'll move on to the next habitat. The, now, the next habitat that I'm going to do was a special request. I don't really have a Patreon page as such. I really don't. I've had a couple of people say, you know, well, you, you should start one. Well, the thing is, I've only got 180 some odd subscribers. Um, you know, I don't have enough to, to warrant, in my opinion, a Patreon page. Because, uh, you know, what, what would I do with it? What would I, you know... But, um, 
that said, that doesn't mean there aren't people who have offered uh, support, not only um, mor you know, not, not, not only moral support, not only uh, uh, giving me emotional support, telling me that I'm you know I'm doing great, don't give up, that kind of thing, but they've actually financially and physically contributed to uh, my efforts here, and um, one of them. A, a very nice girl who streams on Twitch as Empress Tank. Go check out her channel if you if you haven't already. She is actually my my cousin Alana. Um, she's been one of my biggest boosters when it comes to maintaining this channel and, and getting this channel right. Uh, she's helped me out in innumerable ways and large and small. She specifically said that her favorite animal is otters. She loves otters. Well, I figured, you know what? I'm going to add some otters. The giant otter in this um, in this game is a tropical animal, so it would fit right into the zoo. And so the next habitat I'm going to do is the giant otters. And after that, I was thinking Bengal tigers. So giant otters, then Bengal tigers. But first we're going to do some shops, some uh, decoration. Uh, we're going to put in a lot more plants. We're going to clean up the paths, things like that. All right. So let's get started. Now, the first thing I wanted to take care of were these buildings back here. Um, these are staff buildings. They're out of the way. The, the you know they're nicely hidden you might you, you might notice that the you know there's a ton of plants and rocks in between them and the guests so that's not a problem but i wanted to finish setting them up anyway um and what i've been using for the staff buildings is this uh stained wood now i've been using this because the zoo let's put windows the, the zoo that I'm basing all this on, and, and I'll be honest, I left, you know, I, I left that zoo behind several, uh, you know, several episodes ago. So I'm not really recreating that zoo anymore. I'm just using it as a template at this point. Um, but everything, everything they've got, all of their, um, all of their, their staff buildings and such are made out of wood. Um, except the ones that are concrete, but even the concrete ones have wood facing on them, if you know what I mean. Which is why I'm using the stained wood. Now, these are all recolorable. Alright, I'm going to have to do this the hard way. You know, but all these pieces, all these wood pieces, I can recolor to the same color that I'm using on every other uh, staff building. And that is, of course, white. So they look like that. And then I'm using an aquatic, the, the, the aquatic uh, roof. This one right here. Of course, I'm not using the blue, but rather the gray roof. But these are all, re you know, these are all recolorable again. Um, and then. Like that. Okay.
There we go. Now let's find the eaves. One meter eaves, two meter eaves. Probably should have put those on before I recolored everything. That way I wouldn't have to go back and recolor the eaves. But you know what? Oh well. It's a learning process, folks. I had a teacher once tell me that the day you stop learning is the day you start dying. That was a man named Gary Blumenthal, and he was cool. He was a science teacher. And in addition to being a, a very good teacher, a very good um, communicator, <clears throat> a man who really could get you to grasp the ideas that he was trying to tell you, um, what he was really good at was what I call the, the, G, the, the G whiz factor. Um, if you know what I mean. Hold on. Let me get a little closer. Okay. You know, he, he was the science teacher that not only taught you about chemical reactions, but got you to go, oh, wow, when you saw one in action. You know, this is the guy who, when uh, he managed to get a small low-powered low laser for the class, would play games with it. Not because he didn't take it seriously, but because he wanted us to have fun with the science behind lasers. And we learned the science behind lasers, all because he got the message across. That's the kind of teacher, in my opinion, we, that we, you know, the United States needs more of. The kind of teacher that is in it just to show people that you know that not only that, that, that not only teach but actually instill the love of learning in their students because that's just you cannot uh, get enough of that that's just fantastic it's it's such an important thing but uh, but yeah that's what he's you know his, his motto was the day you the day you stop learning is the day you start dying. The day you stop living. And I believe that. I honestly believe that. So. I've tried um, with my own kids. I was, you know, I encourage my own kids to go out and find... Um, find wonder in the world you know you, you, you go out and you show them the cool animals and you you take them places that they can see something that they're never gonna see anywhere else you know an underground waterfall or a place up up high on a mountain where you can see six different states or a river that is so wide that it doesn't look like a river anymore, but rather this endless field of grass because the water's so shallow, but it's still a river. That's the Everglades, by the way, in case anybody's wondering what river I was talking about. Um, the northern, the, the, the uh, southern extents of the Kissimmee River in Florida flow down to the Everglades and eventually widen out to the point that you can't tell it's a river anymore because it's so wide and so shallow that grass is growing everywhere. They actually call it the river of grass and it's just something, it, it's cool. You know, you go, you, you go down there and it's beautiful to look at. Okay. And, you know, it's awe-inspiring. And if you, if you can't find, if you can't find it within yourself to feel awe, oh, for Christ's sake, at the beauty of nature, you have my pity. I know that sounds a little... A little bad but you know what it's the truth 
Come on. Come on. I just want to color this part. Um, you do. You have my pity. If you can't find any awe and wonder at the joys of nature, at the beauty to be found inside nature, then, you know, I feel sorry for you. I really do. All right. Now, let's borrow some plants and rocks and things. And finish this right here. And it doesn't even have to be something like that. I mean, you know, you, you, know, you may be you, you may be saying out there, well, you know, we don't really have anything like the Everglades where I live. Yeah, but I bet you you have something, anything that could be uh, just as beautiful. I mean, I don't, you know, I don't, I've lived all over all, all over the country, and I got to tell you, I've never not found something that was awe-inspiring to look at, and. I'm including the big cities, you know, I'm including the big cities, you know. Okay, so you live in New York City, and you're miles and miles and miles away from um, a true wilderness area, and, you know, the, the closest you've got is maybe Central Park, and you've seen Central Park, so it's just not as awe-inspiring as it used to. I understand that. I get it. But, um, what, how, how, you know, you can still see inspiring stuff inside the city. I mean, just take a look at it with fresh eyes. First time I was at New York City, you know what I was struck by? The absolute beauty. And I know that, you know, for those of you out there who, who live in big cities, the absolute beauty of the Steel Canyon effect. I stood at the end of, uh, I, I stood at, at the end, uh, one end of Times Square. And I looked down this canyon that was made up of bu buildings and streets. And I'm like, Look at that awe-inspiring sight. Look at it. It's beautiful. You know? Sure, it's got billboards and cars and all that number, and you don't think of those things as being awe-inspiring, but that don't matter. Still is. Find a way to take notice of the beauty that's around you. You know? You live out in the desert? Oh, oh man. Some of my greatest memories were from the desert. You know, some of the most beautiful places I ever visited were in the desert. You know, you're in, you, you're, you're, you're on the coastline. Oh, hell. Beaches? Are you kidding me? Beaches are awe-inspiring. I love beaches. Even if you don't have beaches, even if it's just, you know, the, the Central California coastline, which, I'm sorry, guys, but I'm from Florida. Central California don't have a lot, of, a lot in the way of, of beaches that I would say qualify as beaches. What you got is sandlots. That don't make them any less pretty. That don't make them any less awe-inspiring. Find the beauty that's around you. Doesn't matter how sm you know a small meadow. One of the prettiest places I can think of that's within um, a, a, a ten-minute drive from my house is a cow pasture that has this one particular tree in the middle of it. And the tree is huge. It's this old oak. And I, I swear, it's got to be, this oak tree has got to be 100 years old if it's a day. But it's one of the most impressive trees I have ever seen in my life. And it's just out in the middle of a cow pasture. You know, it is... That's all. It, it's not in a park. It's not in, you know, it's, it's effectively somebody's backyard. But it's got this tree, and this tree is epic. It's not that hard. It really isn't. It isn't that hard to, to find beauty in nature. So please, make the effort. You will 
thank yourself. You really will. Anyway, I've been rambling on for a while about you know finding beauty in nature, and I mean it. I, I mean every every single word. Um, please do that. But uh, you know, there's absolutely. You know, th th this is one of the reasons why I play this game. It's because um, I believe in what zoos do. You know, zoos preserve. Sure, their primary. The, their primary reason for existing might be um, to show animals off to human beings who are curious about them. But you know what? They also serve an important purpose in that a lot of zoos are doing very important conservation work, very important conservation work, and have, it, it, and have effectively become lifeboats for certain endangered species. Um, and that's important work. You know, I don't want to see the rhinoceroses die out, but the rhinoceri, I don't see, I, I do not want to see rhinoceri die out. Now, granted, I understand, you know, a lot of people are like, well, you know, human beings are driving them uh, out of, uh, you know, into extinction. I don't think so, really. Let me explain why I don't think so. Um, I mean, d d humans aren't helping. Don't get me wrong. But I don't think we're the primary reason they're going extinct. I, the primary reason they're going extinct is because they've been going to ex they've been going extinct for a long time. A hundred million years ago. Well, not a hundred million years ago, but uh, four million years ago, there were something like five thousand rhinoceros species in the, on on the planet. 75,000 years ago, there were 80 rhinoceros species on the planet. Now there's, what, four? Four species? Human beings haven't been around to cause the extinction of all those species. Let me back this up. You know, we were not around. Uh, you know, human beings as as we are today were not around um, two million years ago to cause the extinction of thousands of rhinoceros species. So obviously there's something else going on there that was causing the extinction of all those rhinoceros species. You know, we might be the latest contributor. You know, we we might be the, the you know we might even be the worst contributor to the extinction of the rhinoceros, but we were hardly the only one. So I don't think rhinoceri were dying. You know, I think they were dying out as a as an animal group long before we showed up. That doesn't say that that, that does not mean, however, that we aren't responsible for them continuing to die out. And it certainly doesn't mean that we can't do something to, uh, to, to keep them around as long as possible. I, I'll, I'll be honest. I don't think it's possible for us to save rhinoceri in the long term. I just don't. I don't think it's possible. I think what's going to happen is the rhinoceri as a family, as, as a, a group of species, are doomed. It's it sounds bad, I know. It sounds bad. But I honestly believe that. I think that nothing that we can do in the long run will actually save rhinoceroses. Um I just I don't think it's possible. And that's a sad thing. You know they're going to die out. We can keep them around as as long as as long as we can. We can we can keep them going. We can offer them sanctuary in zoos and in uh, special wildlife areas that we protect with military force. But in the end, in the end, they're going to die out, no matter what we do. I honestly believe that, and it's a sad thing because I like rhinoceroses. Now, I was only sp I was speaking of rhinoceroses only as one specific example of the kind of thing that I'm talking about. 
but it applies to pretty much any endangered species. Now, there have been amazing uh, success stories when it comes to the preservation of, of uh, species. The American alligator, um, back in the, what was it, the, the early 70s, when they were first put on the endangered species list, the American alligator had only like, um, you know, only like two or three thousand individuals. Twenty years later, there are millions of them alive, to the point that they're not they're not only no longer considered um, endangered, they're not even considered threatened anymore. They're not. Nobody cares if you kill an alligator anymore. And why? Because we successfully brought them back from the brink. We humans did that. And that's just cool. We did that. We humans. We decided, you know what? We want to have alligators in our world. So we decided we're not going to let them die out anymore. And suddenly, blammo! We did everything we had to, and we saved the alligator. What that tells me is that if we try... We can do that for a lot more animal species. Not all of them. Like I said, I don't think there's any hope for the, in the long run, I don't think there's any hope for the, uh, for the rhinoceroses. But I don't think that's entirely the fault of human beings. I think nature has just chosen them to go bye-bye now. Because otherwise there would still be thousands of species, and there's not. And like I said, human beings were not around for, you know, to, to cause the extinction of all thousands and thousands of them. But the alligator has made a comeback. The humpback whale. Anybody ever seen um, that Star Trek movie? Uh, 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 Star Trek The Voyage Home? Where they go into the past and rescue some humpback whales? According to the Cousteau Society, that movie is almost single-handedly responsible for the fact that the humpback whale has gone from a population of about uh, 300 individuals when that movie was made back in the late 80s to over 20,000 individuals today. How cool is that, guys? A Star Trek movie saved the whales. You can't make that shit up. So anyway, um, I'm sorry I kind of went off on a tangent about you know, nature and all that number. Um, as you can see, what I've been doing is basically just decorating. <clears throat> I'm going to get myself a drink of water. Um, you know, nothing but decoration here. Uh, also, I wanted to add some shops because... Um, let me check something here. Let me check what the guests are saying. Guests, energy, hunger, thirst... And education has been going down great. Place has great scenery, and the litter's disgusting. Um, but they want more shops. They want more education. We will do that. Okay? So let's put in some more shops first. You can't... It, it seems to me that you really can't have... Now, you might notice I'm doing this all paused. You can't really have enough drink shops. So I'm just going to do this right here. It doesn't want to pl be placed there. Okay. Really? Why? Is it the path? Is it the path? Is that what you're bothered by? The path? It might be the path. Anyway. No, no, no. 
Okay, that's wrong. Yeah.